Welcome back to another Passage Breakdown. I'm John. Today we're going to be going through the AAMC FLE 5, the practice exam, the free one. And we are going to be looking at passage number three in the biology biochemistry section. And we're actually going to be looking at something that you'll be studying in medical school, which is pretty cool. We're talking about erythropoietin. So let's see what this passage which is pretty much just a paragraph and a half has to say. So it says that erythropoietin, EPO, is a glycoprotein hormone. Okay, so remember when we're flow charting this out, we're focusing on basic sciences. We highlight those or we write them down. I highlight them for brevity's sake. Glycoprotein and hormones are both basic sciences. That stimulates the production of erythrocytes, which is just a red blood cell, in red bone marrow. So if you didn't know that, then you could say that EPO leads to an increase in red blood cells. Although EPO is primarily produced and released by the kidneys in response to low tissue levels of oxygen, so there's another um, relationship there, is that low oxygen, say PaO2, which is partial pressure of ar arterial oxygen, leads to high EPO. Several other tissues, like the liver, neurons of the CNS, um, neurons is basic science. Liver, not so much. You don't talk about the liver much on the MCAT. But all of these can produce EPO. EPO binds to EPOR in the erythrocyte precursor cells, causing them to differentiate into mature erythrocytes. So we get this EPO binds to EPOR, we get maturation. And then they're released into circulation. So this is just talking about how we make blood cells. So we get low oxygen and our blood cells are what carry oxygen, right? And so whenever our body senses low oxygen and our kidneys usually, then it's like, okay, well, let's release this erythropoietin. And erythropoietin goes and it binds to receptors called EPORs. And these EPORs tell the bone marrow, we need to make more red blood cells because we've got to carry more oxygen. Our body's not getting enough. It's thirst. So as the oxygen carrying capacity of blood increases, secretion by EPO by the kidneys decreases. So that is a relationship, but it's this relationship right here. So I'm not going to rewrite it. It's just the inverse of that. It says neurons in the CNS also express EPOR and EPO has been shown to decrease apoptosis. So increased EPO leads to decreased apoptosis to both erythrocyte precursor cells and CNS neuron. EPO also promotes angiogenesis, which is the production of new blood cells. So we can also include that in our flow chart. The human EPO gene, so genes, that's a basic science, right? That's just a sequence of DNA that codes for a protein, has been cloned and expressed in vitro. The recombinant gene product Recombinant just means just means like synthesized is, and I don't know that, so you might want to check that. It's frequently administered to patients who have anemia. Anemia is low blood cells, low red blood cells, resulting from either kidney failure or chemotherapy. So kidney failure or chemotherapy can be treated with this recombinant erythropoietin. So essentially low red blood cells. More recently, it has been shown that a significant number of tumors express EPOR, even though the healthy tissues from the tumor was derived do not. Experiments in my indicate that EPO prevents apoptosis and increased angiogenesis in at least some of EPOR positive tumors. So you'll learn a lot about this, about how tumor cells will hijack specific systems that our body has set in place and use them in kind of like a malicious way. And this is one example of it. So tumors will hijack this pathway that will decrease apoptosis because a tumor cell does not want to pop, right? And will increase angiogenesis, meaning that you will get more blood vessels feeding to the tumor so that it, it can keep eating and keep growing so it's not going to die because there's no apoptosis and it's going to keep eating so it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger so that's a really insidious thing that some tumors will do there's actually specific drugs i think, I think like bevacuzumab is one of them that will target that specific process of course none of that is only mcat but Sometimes correlating this stuff makes you a little bit more motivated to work more passages and pay attention more because you see that this stuff is actually relatable to what you're going to be doing, unless you're in the car section. So that's it. That's a pretty basic passage, but the I think the flow chart's pretty decent here. We, we Especially this one right there, that little piece of it kind of tells us a whole lot. So let's take a look at the questions, make sure that we're rephrasing all of them that we can, go through the answer choices, knock out the bad ones, select the good one. So. Starting with number 15, it says an increase in which of the following physiological variables is most likely to cause an increase in the amount of erythropoietin released by the kidneys in a healthy human adult. Well, our flow chart said that we get erythropoietin when we have low oxygen. So I'm pretty much rephrasing this one as which of these answer choices is low oxygen. So A says if we increase, because remember the question system says we're increasing it, if we increase the amount of aerobic exercise that a person performs, so if you start going for a run, yeah, probably that's gonna that's gonna decrease your oxygen. So 
A is going to decrease the amount of oxygen in your blood, which would in turn increase the amount of EPO, so maybe A. B says if we increase the total amount of circulating hemoglobin, would that increase or decrease the amount of oxygen in our blood? It probably increases, it, so maybe not A, or I'm sorry, maybe not B. C, if we increase the rate of erythrocyte maturation, this is just saying increasing red blood cells. Well, no, red blood cells carry oxygen, so no, that's not gonna decrease the amount of oxygen in our blood. D says if we increase the amount of cardiac output, and then it defines cardiac output by saying the volume of blood pumped by the heart per minute. Well, if we increase how much blood is pumped out of the heart, then we increase how much blood gets to our tissues and things like our kidneys. And, and our kidneys, like the path just told us, is pretty much like the gatekeeper for who, you know, when we dump out erythropoietin or not. So this would be more blood, more oxygen at the kidneys, not less. So we can rule out D as well, and the correct answer here would be A. Um, number 15, I'm sorry, 16 says, interested in developing ways to treat human strokes, researchers are attempting to, to develop forms of EPO that acts on CNS neurons without affecting erythrocyte production in the bone marrow. One benefit of such a form of EPO in stroke treatment would be to what? So they're saying, how can we get the CNS benefits of like decreasing apoptosis, and maybe increasing angiogenesis without impacting our bone marrow? So meaning without cranking up how much red blood cells we actually produce. And the question says, what would be good about that? Okay, so we're pretty much just looking for the one that is going to be talking about getting the benefits of like reperfusing your brain because blood in your brain is pretty good without talking about cranking up how many red blood cells are in your blood. So to understand that though, it's probably best to note that if this were like a test tube with your blood um, and it came all the way up here, like yeah, maybe it would be red, but most of that is not red blood cells. If you were actually to separate what's red blood cells and the rest of the proteins like albumin and stuff, maybe it would settle down here and the rest of this liquid um, which you probably are thinking about like in from your like Ochem and Gene Chem classes is like the supernatant, if you remember that. It's the liquid that sits on top of the, the sediment or, or the solid part. That is plasma. So that's the term like plasma, if you've ever heard of it. And that's good to understand for this question. Not necessary, but good. So A says one benefit of this is that it would promote apoptosis of damaged CNS neurons. Okay, so... To know that this is like a really bad answer choice, you have to first understand that neurons don't really like grow back. What you've got is kind of what you're gonna have. So you would not want to apoptose them. So maybe not A. B says that we would limit neuron cell death without causing an immediate decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Okay, so the second half right here is implying that if we are to crank up the amount of erythropoietin or the amount of red blood cells, then we are going to get a decrease in oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. But that's not necessarily the truth. If you have more red blood cells, more carriers, more UPS trucks, then you can deliver more packages, right? So you can actually carry more oxygen. So B is false for that reason because it's, it's implying something that's incorrect. C says that if we do this, then we would prevent apoptosis in the CNS without causing a harmful increase in blood viscosity. What's viscosity? It's the thickness of a liquid or a gelatinous substance. Um, and so that's going to be the correct answer here because we would get the benefits of preventing apoptosis in the CNS, which would be helpful for a stroke because we don't want to pop our brains, but we would not cause a crazy rise in blood viscosity because if we were to increase the percentage of this test tube that is solid red blood cells, then our blood is going to get really thick and sludgy. Our heart's going to have to push really hard to crank that, and we're going to get things like hypertension, maybe heart failure, um, a lot of signs of something you'll learn called polycythemia vera. C is a good answer choice. D says promote healing in the CNS without increasing the risk of developing tumors. No, remember we talked about how this process is something that tumors take advantage of. And so if you do it more naturally, well then tumors are going to eventually possibly learn how to do it. So you don't want to introduce that agent. So maybe not D. Correct answer here is C. This next one says expression of the recombinant human erythropoietin gene in E. coli bacteria produced an EPO protein that did not increase erythrocyte production when injected into humans. And the most likely reason for this observation is that what? Okay, so the MCAT does this a lot. They are dressing this up as a really fancy question. But the question is simply, which of these answer choices can a eukaryotic cell do that a prokaryotic cell cannot do? or which of these can a prokaryote not do? 
ACEs prokaryotic ribosomes interpret the genetic code in a completely different manner than do eukaryotic ribosomes. That's not true. Remember, our ribosomes are all looking at RNA, so, so maybe not. I know that there are some differences that like prokaryotes will feed immediately from transcription and translation, but you're reading too much into it if you're looking there. Um, they, they still are interpreting the genetic code the same even if there are nuances between. B says E. coli cannot glycosylate EPO in the same way that it is glycosylated by eukaryotic cells. Okay, well, where is erythropoietin glycosylated? Probably somewhere like the Golgi apparatus or something like that, right? Maybe, maybe like an endoplasmic reticulum. I think it's the Golgi though. Okay, well, regardless, does E. coli, does a bacteria have either of those membrane-bound organelles? No. So it can't do this. It cannot glycosylate EPO because the location for glycosylation of EPO is a membrane-bound organelle. So, may, so, so I like B. That is something that a prokaryote cannot do. It's a true statement. C says bacteria are unable to secrete eukaryotic proteins. That's not true. They secrete tons of eukaryotic proteins. Think about like toxins that, that get out. Also think about how different genetics have taken advantage of like these bacteria that will crank out different proteins that, that we can use. There's a lot of genetic manipulations that take advantage of the fact that bacteria can crank out eukaryotic proteins, which is kind of in line with A. And then D says only viruses contain the necessary cellular machinery to express recombinant uh, proteins. No, that's not true. Um, they're, they're trying to get you here by making you think like retroviruses, um, but we're talking about something different. Retroviruses and recombinant proteins are different things. Um, bacteria can express recombinant proteins. So the correct answer here would be B. The next one says, assume that a certain dominant mutation in the EPO gene exists such that a person who carries this mutant EPO allele has a higher than normal number of circulating erythrocytes. So you've got a bunch of red blood cells. Which of the following best describes the mechanism by which this mutation could have its effect? Okay, so how could this mutation cause us to have a bunch of red blood cells? A says the promoter of the mutant EPO is defective and the allele is not transcribable. Well, that would make us have less, right? So maybe not A. B says the, the mutant EPO allele produces a protein that has an increased affinity for EPO R. I kind of like that because if we increase the affinity erythroproietin to its receptor, then we're going to increase how often they bind, how frequently genes get transcribed, and red blood cells get made. So I like B. C says the mRNA produced by the mutant EPO allele is degraded before translation can occur. That would decrease it. D says the mutant EPO allele produces a protein that is unable to bind its receptor. That would decrease red blood cells. B is the correct answer. All the others would probably lead to some kind of anemia. Number next to last says, which of the following cellular locations does EPO most likely initially bind EPO R in erythrocyte precursor cells? Okay, where does EPO bind EPO R is the question. Anytime they're talking about like a hormone binding somewhere else, the first thing you need to think about is am I dealing with a steroid hormone, a peptide hormone, or some kind of like thyroxin derivative like T3, T4. And what does this tell us? It says it's a protein hormone. So where do protein hormones bind is the, the, what this question is asking. They bind on the plasma membrane, right, because they cannot penetrate this phospholipid bilayer because they are only like hydrophilic, they can't get through the tails. So correct answer is D. If it had asked for a steroid hormone, the correct answer would have been the nucleus, or some of them bind within the cytosol. Certain types of kidney tumors continuously produce and release EPO. Such tumors most likely have which of the following effects, if any, on erythrocyte production. So this is pretty much asking about our flow chart. It's saying if we have like constant production of erythropoietin, What's going to happen to our red blood cells? Well, we go back to our flow chart. It says that, like, well, whenever we have erythropoietin, we get increased red blood cells. So let's check that out, see if we can find it. A, the liver will take over the process of regulating erythrocyte production. That's not how organs work. They don't just, like, you can take the day off, kidneys. I got you. Like, that's not how it works. So maybe not A. B says erythrocyte production within the bone marrow will cease. Well, no, it's saying like, you know, work harder, keep flexing, you got this. Maybe not B. C says constant stimulation of, of red blood cell production will occur within the bone marrow. That's true. If you have constant signals to crank it out, you're going to have constant production. D says there's no effect. Erythrocyte production will continue to be regular. Yeah, you can get cancer and nothing will happen. <laughs> That's what D is saying. Um, so the correct answer here is C. So short passage um, 
fairly easy sciences, but you really had to dig in there. But regardless, thank you for watching the video. Make sure to check out the links in the description. I think that you'll find something there that you can really benefit from. Join the Discord channel so you can study with us. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.